thank you so much for inviting me to speak about from the minor IT glitches here. I am a doctor. I, I'm a gynaecologist. I work in an IVF clinic, but I'm also a clinical academic and work for the University of Dundee. Uh, I've got some uh, disclosures here about uh, grant funding and the likes. Uh, next slide, thanks. So the fundamental question, uh, sorry, next slide, please. So the fundamental question I think I want to try and address is, are sperm counts falling? And I guess this is a, you know, I feel that I'm going to sort of slightly tread on uh, Andreas's toes here a little bit, but kind of repeating the same kind of um, review of, of, of the data that we already know. So first slide, next slide, please. So first of all, there is this publication from uh, Elizabeth Carlson and co in um, Copenhagen, and this is from 30 years ago. And what this group did was they looked at publications from the preceding half century, and they looked specifically at semen quality in men, and particularly men who had no particular history of fertility issues. And looking at these various publications and nearly 15,000 uh, samples from, from men, they looked at the average sperm count and seminal volume of the ejaculate over time. And the headline of this was that they saw about a 40% decline of the sperm count over the time that they looked at. And you would think that's quite a, you know, a, a historical finding, quite a worrying finding, but actually, although it raised some controversy at the time, nothing very much changed. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So roll forward the clock 25 years and, and the group from Israel headed up by Levine um, looked again at semen quality from early 80s onwards. And they again had hundreds and hundreds of studies, thousands and thousands of sperm samples, again looked at a sperm concentration and a total sperm count. Because sperm concentration is millions per mil and an ejaculate is often more than one mil. So therefore you have a total count in each ejaculate. And what they found was remarkably similar. They found some ropes of between 50 and 60 percent decline across the years from 1973 to 2011. Again, this was a population of men who were having semen analysis, not for fertility problems. But there were critics of the study because they said, well, you know, you know, this is quite controversial, but we're not sure we believe the data. And actually, you've only really looked at certain segments of the population. You haven't looked at a global population. Next slide, please. So roll forward the clock again, and this is a publication that was, that was published less than three weeks ago, and this now addressed the issue that was the sort of, again, updated data, added more studies, more men, more samples, but also looked globally, and you can see in the map there the representation of it. And again, what they found was year on year, there's about a 1% decline in the sperm count, and the total sperm count and the sperm concentration had declined by 50 to 60%. And this was in the press only three weeks ago. And I think, you know, it's very topical, but it hasn't really raised the, the anxiety or the, or the, or the level of, of, of perhaps media interest that you might expect. Next slide. However, there are some people who, you know, are panicking about this and who, uh, you know, globally, this has been presented as, as, as a major issue. Spermageddon is male fertility in free fall. And on the other hand, next slide, there's a group of people who just say they don't believe the data. They still don't believe the data. Next slide. So why would that be? So, as I say, before there was a, a contradiction of the, of the meta-analysis that was done saying, well, you know, we only looked at Western studies. I think this next publication has addressed that. And there's this assumption that sperm count does equate to male infertility. But actually, even though the level is around 49 million per mil, you can see that that is well above the recommended sort of uh, level that is required for fertility, which is 16 million per mil. So the levels are nowhere close to a discriminatory, discriminatory sperm count. And the biggest critics of all of this is that these studies have been done over such a long period of time that actually technology and the way that we do diagnostic semen analysis has changed with time. And therefore, the older studies perhaps aren't as reliable. Next slide. So over the course of the last four decades, there have been several iterations of, of the WHO World Health Organization Laboratory, uh, which is a hugely detailed manual about how to examine, how to count sperm, how to perform diagnostic semen analysis. 
next slide. And if you think about the evolution, I thought of the mobile phone as a you know, fairly good example, or telephone even is a good example of how our technology has evolved over this same time period. And so there is clearly a huge amount of technology that has changed. And perhaps that would be an argument to say, yeah, maybe we shouldn't. Igno you know, maybe we should ignore these older studies. Maybe we're, you know, kind of making too much of a big deal out of out of the data that we see. Next slide, please. The other hand, though, these are semen. Uh, sorry, these are microscopes used for semen analysis, and actually, the optics and so on are better. But there really hasn't been a huge and fundamental change in the same way as other technology there has been. And importantly, on the right of the screen, you'll see these little slides, which are called hemocytometers. So these are glass slides that the semen sample is dropped into. A cover slip with a, with a grid is put over the top for us to be able to count the sperm. And so the technology is, you know, better than it was, but there's not a huge categorical shift from one to another. And so in the pub most recent publication from the Vine, they state, you know, we used all of this same technology, we used all of these same slides, so there's a lot of similarity in the techniques and the technology that we've used. Next slide, please. So, okay, well, let's move on from that then. Are there any other implications for male health? Next slide. And I think Andreas has already touched on this, but there's this thought that actually declining semen quality and also an increasing demand for assisted reproduction technology, IVF and so on, is part of a bigger triad of, of, of problems which is, uh, you know, uh, embraced as a, as a, a syndrome called testicular dys dysgenesis syndrome. And this is thought to be as a result of a combination of exposures. We already talked quite a bit about environmental exposures, particularly the maternal exposure of the baby growing inside the mum's tummy in the test exposure at that time, but also life exposures during the course of a, of a child and an adolescent and a male's lifespan, but also genetic contribution to that. And they kind of brand these kind of con con concept together of, of also not only a problem with sperm, but also an increasing risk of testicular cancer and an increasing frequency of abnormalities related, you know, both birth defects relating to the male reproductive tract. So is that true? Is that really what's going on? Let's have a look. Next slide, please. So here is some uh, slides that present the incidence of testicular cancer. The uh, graph on the left is US studies and the blue line there is the, uh, the, the, the white European Caucasian whatever demographic. And similarly on the, the graph on the right, the right red line is this ever, ever increasing trajectory of testicular cancer incidence. So I think there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that the incidence of testicular cancer is going up. The graph on the right, the lower green line, shows the survival or mortality rather from, from testicular cancer. So this is the commonest cancer that affects our young men in their sort of late teens and early 20s. It's the 20th most common cancer globally, but it is particularly a preponderance within white males that this is the problem. But this is an eminently survivable cancer with the right kind of platinum-based chemotherapy. Next slide, please. So this is a map that kind of presents the incidence of testicular cancer. It's an interesting map because you can see that the darker the blue, the higher the rates of, of testicular cancer. So spanning across Europe, North America, Australia, Australasia, there are uh, you know, quite definitive populations that seem to be more affected by this. Next slide, please. So then we talked also a little bit about um, uh, birth defects. And the two that I want to talk about is cryptorchidism, which is undescended testes. So the testis starts off as a gonad within the abdominal cavity and descends through the inguinal canal to end up in its resting place within the scrotum. And between one and five percent of newborn boys are affected by an undescended testes, either one or both. But it's much, much more common in premature babies because the, the, the way that the fetus develops and the baby develops across the course of a gestation is, uh, equates to how that testicle moves and grows as, uh, uh, and replaces into the scrotal sac. 
Now, the issue is if you have an undescended test is that it needs to be corrected. It needs to be corrected within the first few months of life by uh, relocating the testicle into the scrotum and doing some sort of surgical suture to keep it in the right place. Otherwise, you run the risk of losing all possible fertility later in life. But also a, a testicle that's within the abdomen is exposed to a much higher temperature and therefore a longer term risk of testicular cancer. So if you come across a teenager or an older adult with uh, uh, abdominal testes, then these are often just removed because of the risk of cancer and because they don't work to do what they need to do in terms of producing testosterone or sperm. Next slide. So the data for cryptorchidism is quite interesting. You can see on the slide on the left, the preponderance of uh, or, or the uh, uh, the frequency of uh, uh, boys in Denmark, the UK and Finland is on an increasing trajectory across the last half century. But yet on the other side of that uh, graph is, is a, a, a study from uh, Nova Scotia and Canada. And you can see there that actually perhaps it's declining or perhaps it's certainly un, unaltered. Although the authors do go on to say, actually, you know, we have a very high incidence in Canada. So maybe it's a good thing that this isn't going any higher. So I think it's fair to say that the data seems to be, again, a geographical location, but that it seems in some places that the incidence is going up and in some places it, it perhaps isn't. Next slide, please. Similarly, hyperspadia. So this is where you have your urethral opening, which is usually at the tip of the penis, where urine and so on would exit the body, is, is malformed and then exits under the, the penis at various different um, locations. And the classification accord, accords to where the defect arises. But this is, again, an early into uterine event of when the urethra forms and it's usually within the first sort of trimester and certainly it's all uh, kind of completed by 14 weeks of pregnancy. There's no other way of, of, of dealing with these type of uh, congenital abnormalities apart from to do surgical reconstruction and that can sometimes be very very involved across a, a number of procedures. Again uh, next slide please. Again, the data on this would suggest that overall across the, the, the world, the incidence is going up, although different geographical regions have different um, uh, rates of increase. Next slide, please. So then lastly, just to touch back on then assisted conception, the need for assisted conception, there's three graphs that I present to you here. The graph on the left is uh, the uh, amount of IVF that is done in Israel. And Israel is an interesting country because they have an NHS type, type sort of healthcare system and patients can have as much IVF as they need or want uh, to achieve a family. And so you can see that if you aren't restricted by finance in any way, that actually the rate of uh, requirement for IVF is going up and up probably by about nine to 10% each year. The graph in the middle is how many cycles of IVF ICSI are done in the US per year. Obviously, it's a much more fiscally challenged uh, environment for um, healthcare purposes. But again, you can see that the annual growth is somewhere between five, seven percent per annum. And the graph on the right is the European registry. So these are all countries that participate in the ESHRA data set. And if you add the bl dark blue and the bright green lines together, because that's IVF and ICSI that are prepared, uh, pr projected separately there, you can see again, you have this cycle uh, number of, of assisted reproduction that's going up and up and up year on year on year. Next slide, please. So lastly, I want to talk to you or think about sperm function. Sperm are extraordinary, extraordinary cells. They're hugely specialized. They don't do other things that uh, normal cells do, and they do not uh, They do a lot of things differently to, to cells. And therefore, they're very vulnerable to uh, oxidative stress and other sort of environmental insults and the mechanisms of that, some of which is understood and some of which is not understood. Next slide, please. So one of the problems is that the cells uh, don't have very much machinery within the cytoplasm. The filling of the cell is very light in the sense that it doesn't have a lot of ability to be able to manufacture new proteins, new uh, growth products, new energy sources and so on. So the sperm cells themselves very much rely on cell signaling and, and changes, particularly of calcium. It's absolutely fundamental to how a sperm swims and how a sper sperm finds the egg, gets the egg, fertilizes the egg and so on. And we know that if we measure intracellular calcium levels and the responses to ca certain chemicals within the sperm cells, that this will then 
be able to predict IVF fertilization rates and by extrapolation, presumably natural conception and the ability to fertilize an egg in vivo. We also know that hydrogen ions, the level of hydrogen or pH within the sperm cell is critical to its, how it swims and, 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 it, and male fertility as well. And both intracellular calcium and the ion channel uh, and hydrogen ions are primarily determined by ion channels. So these are little membrane pores within the sperm membrane. There's also some calcium stores that contribute to certain activities of the cell. But overall, I one of my fundamental kind of interests is in sperm ion channels and these specialized pores. Next slide, please. So within the sperm cell is a specific uh, ion channel called cat spur or the cation channel of sperm. This was first described over a decade ago by Lishko and Strunka, and it's a calcium channel which is not expressed anywhere else in the body. So not in the heart, not in the cardiovascular system, nowhere other than the testes and specifically in the flagellum, the tail of the sperm. It's a sperm specific pro protein and it's located along the flagellum and these lovely um, aminocytochemistry pictures here basically stained the cat spur proteins and you can see that there's four domains and across the uh, the sperm tail they're like racing uh, racing stripes down the tail of the of the sperm cell and these are these sort of um, series of membrane pores that are calcium permeable next slide please so the cat spur ion channel, very, very, very complicated channel. It's a big, big channel complex. And so far, it's not been possible to be able to build this in an in vivo, uh, in vitro model. But there are four subunits, one, two, three, four, six further auxiliary subunits and another chaperone protein. And all of these various elements are required for a fully functioning channel. So if any one of these elements is missing or, or perturbed in some way, then the calcium channel won't work and the sperm function is lost. And so there is also various different types of ways of activating this calcium channel to allow calcium internalizing into the cell, particularly in response to the hormones that the sperm might see naturally within the uh, female reproductive tract. So progesterone that's produced in a lot of uh, a quantity from the egg, prostaglandins and so on, but also alterations in pH, particularly in alkaline pH. And this very, very much links in with what Andreas was talking about before about these, all these different chemicals, environment toxicants and pollutants, because these all can affect this calcium channel too. And if you affect the way that that works, then you affect the, the way that the sperm can swim or can't swim. You affect the possibility of the sperm being able to fertilize an egg. Next slide, please. Now there's two other channels that are also important to the way that cat spur work. One is called K-spur, it's a potassium channel uh, and it maintains the membrane potential to hyperpolarized state, so a negative uh, potential across the membrane. And there's also a, a, a hydrogen channel, H1, HV1, which is responsible for internalization of hydrogen ions. And these are also critical. Now the hydrogen channels, HV1 channels, are, are located just in two stripes down one side. And the idea is that if you activate these channels, perhaps that's responsible for uh, turning or, or uh, asymmetrical bending of the fl flagella to allow it to change course and uh, perhaps to find the egg, for example. Next slide, please. So interestingly and fundamentally here, ion channels are part of how a sperm works and how a part of a sperm perhaps doesn't work. And this isn't something that you would pick up when you're counting sperm or when you're analyzing sperm to assess male fertility, but this is something that we see in men who have apparently normal sperm counts. So this may well be an extra layer of problem that the environment and, and all these exposures and these chemicals you know, are, are affecting the way sperm work as much as testicular function and so on. It might be a sort of a double whammy effect if that's the, the right way to describe it. And certainly we know from the studies that we've done and published that iron channel dysfunction is a very common problem. Probably about 10% of patients have uh, with un apparently unexplained infertility have a problem particularly with the potassium channel and the cat spur um, abnormalities. They tend to be quite rare. Some of them are genetic. And, and as I say, there's some publications here that we have worked on. So. Last slide, thanks. In summary, sperm counts, are they falling? I, it might be explained by an evolution in methodology, but I genuinely believe this is a real phenomenon. Having said that, although sperm counts have halved, 49 point whatever million is not near to the point where we're worrying about extinction of Homo sapiens. 
My big worry, though, is that we see a whole wreath of other things that are affecting male reproductive health. We see the incidence of testicular cancer increasing, but not all parts of the globe are affected equally. We see an increase in cryptorchidism and hyperspadius affecting the male reproductive tract, and they are it is probably increasing. But the mechanisms are really not well understood, and the global data, again, is inconsistent. For sure, demand for assisted conception is increasing, and I hope I've presented some of the other work that we've done around sperm dysfunction, which I believe is a significant also contributor to male unexplained infertility. I think the one thing that I would say is we genuinely don't understand the real minutiae of this problem, and we certainly need to study this more and understand it better. Thank you very much.